Committee on Public Education come to order. The clerk call the roll. Hubert Here. Representative Bernal. Here. Representative Allen. Here. Representative Allison. Here. Representative Ashby. Here. Representative Bell. Here. Representative Gonzalez. Representative King. Here. Representative Meyer. Here. And Representative Van Dever. All right, quorum's present. Uh, welcome back, everybody. It doesn't seem like we left, Ken, does it? I mean, I mean, what the hell? <laughs> We've had so many meetings during the interim, it's unbelievable. So this is old cat. But uh, who? Yeah, did we call Sanford? Yeah. Did we call Sanford? No, I didn't. Oh, Sanford here? Sanford. Okay. Sorry, guys. And Jimmy's here. And Rico? I don't know. It's, it's our first meeting, so. It is. We're trying. You got it now? Okay. I only had 11 spots on All right. That's right. Um, all right. Now a quorum is present. So, uh, so anyways, welcome back, everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to, well, yes, what? Okay. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, our old members back, uh, and I'd also like to welcome our new members uh, to the committee, and then also some returning members. So, um, uh, you know, first of all, I'd like to personally thank Speaker Bonin for the opportunity uh, to serve. Role. I think that it's very important this legislative session. Uh, we did a lot of work uh, during the interim, and uh, I'll open it up for comments here shortly. And uh, for anybody that wants to speak, and things I'd like to say. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to introduce our crack committee staff that's with us today. Uh, <laughs> Amy Peterson is our committee director, um, and we are going to be hiring a clerk for the session. But for now, uh, Amy will be your uh, point of contact as we go forward. Um, also today, Lily uh, uh, True is with us here today. She's one of our interns. She's gonna be helping uh, on our hearings on Tuesdays, uh, along with other interns in our office. Um, and uh, I am going to open up any of the committee members that would like to make an opening comment before we get started. Nobody? Dr. Allen, nobody? Okay, all right, good. Yeah, absolutely. All right, a couple things. Uh, I'm going to point out two things for everybody is that, um, you know, every uh, last session, one of the things we gave for a committee gift, everybody got an apple. But this apple is very special for those of you who haven't been in this committee. Um, this came from a friend of mine who was a teacher whose uh, uh, daughter passed away, Stephanie Sampley, and they came from Gail Sampley. And we put this up here to remind ourselves that we're here about the kids. We're not about politics. This committee. Um, is has always been and tries to be as nonpartisan as possible because we're fighting for 5.4 million children. Uh, and so we remind ourselves of that. Um, we will from time to time have fights, but uh, this is the opportunity to do that. The other two things that I want to point out for the new members and also the returning members is that this is the interim report for the Committee on Public Education. If you haven't familiar yourself with it, I would encourage you to do so. Make sure your staff familiars yourself with it. These are all the charges that were that we had that we're going to be dealing with this legislative session from uh, Hurricane Harvey on on its way down. And if you recall, at the end of last session, at the end of the um, special session, uh, one week after we got done, Hurricane Harvey hit, and we dealt with that uh, very early in the legislative session and relative to budgetary issues. And as Chairman Ashby knows, um, we had appropriators going in trying to figure out what that's going to cost and those are going to be some of the things that we're going to be dealing with uh, in addition to that um, I'd like to personally um, thank uh, the work that uh, uh, Chairman King and uh, Chairman uh, Bernal did relative to the School Finance Commission <laughs> for those of you that didn't pay attention or have a School Finance Commission um, and uh, <laughs> and um, we had over 40 meetings uh, at least I did uh, relative to the working groups and everything else, and we published the report uh, on this. And uh, I think it's important for everybody to uh, to recognize the work that was put into that by a bar bipartisan commission of legislators um, and private citizens uh, and some other elected officials uh, that were out there. Uh, and in that report, it talked a lot about outcomes. It talked a lot about um, incentive pay for teachers, but there were over 35 recommendations that were made, 35. And, uh, and, and realistically, at changing the entirety of the school finance system. And for those of you that have not been on this committee or forget, uh, the last time that real reforms were made in 1984. Um, and so this is the opportunity for us to, to make those changes. 
Um, and, you know, the good news is, is that the appropriators and the speaker and, and uh, the leaders within, our, within, our, within the House um, have appropriated or put $9 billion uh, into that uh, system. And uh, ultimately, the goal is, is that we're going to be working through that. And so your work schedule, as we put it out for you uh, over the next couple weeks, uh, is such that we are going to meet. When do we meet? What time in the morning on the 5th and 6th? We meet in the morning or we meet in the afternoon? Upon, upon, upon judging. Afternoon. Yeah. So on the 5th and the 6th, we're going to meet upon adjournment. The 5th, um, we're going to have a school finance kind of 101 and the issues that we need to address. And then on the 6th, we plan on having uh the uh the uh, some of the commissioners that were on the school finance commission coming to present the the school finance report and then on the 12th and the 13th uh, we are going to have invited testimony from anybody that wants to shoot holes in the school finance commission report i'm sure that'll be a long list of people uh, but we will invite anybody that wants to come talk i would encourage you to talk with amy uh, but we will have invited testimony on that and then starting on the 19th we will start hearing bills um, and uh, uh, we will kind of go through that process. And if you are a member of this committee, you've been told how to do that, and we'll certainly let any other members that want to do it. Uh, we will not hear bills if people don't ask for a hearing, um, and, uh, but we will get busy and get to work pretty quickly. And then ultimately, as we go through this process, um, as you know, we can't pass a bill uh, until March, early March, uh, but one of the bills, as we learned, as I learned uh, personally from dealing with school finance last session, is that we're going to get out a little bit ahead of that this time and get that moving fairly quickly. Um, so with that, I don't have any other any other questions at all for where we get going. Okay, great. All right, so let's move on to our agenda items today. We're going to receive updates from Commissioner Morath uh, and the TEA staff on some of the recent initiatives and issues that have come in the interim. And right now, we will start with Commissioner Morath. Please join us. State your name. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, my name is Commissioner of the Texas Education Agency. Um, I'd like to apologize in advance. When hearings come up, I essentially move um, whatever schedule I have so that I can um, devote myself fully to you. But unfortunately, uh, today I'm scheduled to speak with 5,000 of my closest friends at the TASA Midwinter Conference and, have a, uh, and as a result have a hard stop at 9 o'clock. Um, let me uh, let me go ahead. You should have a, a slide deck in front of you, so I'm going to try to go um, as quickly as possible given time constraints. Um, uh, I'll start with the current education landscape in Texas, um, and that means I start with how well our kids are doing. Um, if you look at slide four, um, this is a set of statistics that sort of covers the waterfront of public education. We'll start with kindergarten readiness. So think five-year-olds in the fall, um, whether they are, um, uh, they've reached a level of preparation from their home life or pre-K or otherwise um, to get to um, uh, uh, the capability of, of learning their letters and numbers in kindergarten. So about 47% of our uh, five-year-olds are ready for school when school begins. Um, uh, fast forward a few years, third grade. End of third grade, we um, uh, uh, begin asking whether kids have mastered their grade level content um, uh, in, in reading and math um, as, it, as, it, as adopted by the standards of the State Board of Education. About half of our kids are on um, grade level in reading and math. Um, uh, fast forward again five more years, the end of eighth grade, and we've made improvements with our kids. The longer that they are in school, the better uh, that we do with them. Um, but still um, only a little over half of kids are reading and doing math at, um, uh, at grade level at the end of eighth grade. College readiness as assessed by the SAT or ACT remains essentially static for the state as a whole. Only 16% of graduating seniors are prepared for college according to the SAT or ACT. Now you, you will find that there are other ways of measuring readiness than just that, but that one has been um, around for a long time, so it's a, it's a pretty good measure to look at. Um, graduation rates have reached an all-time high, and we are the top five of all states in the United States in graduation rates. It is really quite remarkable um, what our educators have done um, to make sure that kids uh, reach that particular credential. Um, uh, college enrollment uh, has slipped in, in recent years, so 55% of new kids. Uh, Graduates are in college, and the word college here should be thought of as fairly loose. Um, so that's a trade school, um, a junior college, or any kind of four-year uh, degree program, and that's uh, anywhere in the country that we have data on them. 
Um, and then um, when you think about our overall goal uh, of getting 60% of young people to possess, possess some form of post-secondary credential, um, and by some form of post-secondary credential, I mean a trade credential, an associate's degree, or a bachelor's degree. So within six years of high school graduation, uh, currently only one in four high school students in Texas um, have uh, earned one of those credentials, a welding licensure, um, a you know, certified nursing assistant, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree. So that's that's the, what the data shows us. Um, the next slide, uh, slide five, gives you a 20-year picture of SAT and ACT. And you'll uh, notice of interest is that um, the sort of top line is, is say, middle-class kids, uh, non-economically disadvantaged. The bottom line is economically disadvantaged kids. And we have gotten better with all of our kids. We are doing better with poor kids. We are doing better with middle class kids. But on the whole, we haven't changed. Uh, and the reason uh, is obvious on the next slide, slide six, is because our students have become markedly um, um, uh, poorer, at least from lower income households, over the last 20 years. So even though our educators finally improved the effectiveness of our system over the last 20 years. Um, the, the, the short version of the story is we're just not getting better fast enough, and it's, it's just a very difficult job. Certainly, I see Representative Van Dever, who, uh, a former superintendent and several school board members that know how difficult um, this work is. It is just incredibly difficult work, and, and we are clearly getting better as a state and as a system, um, but the rate at which we are um, improving um, does not look uh, supportive of meeting our overall 60 by 30 goals. Um, the next slide, slide seven, gives a 10-year a, a picture of all-in funding. This is state, local, um, and federal. And if you define recapture as local or state, I don't really care. We've itemized it out so that you can define it any way you like. But um, it does give you a, a picture of per pupil spending over the last 10 years. Um, now on to our uh, sort of operational um, um, uh, uh, status uh, as an agency. Can I stop you yes, real quick, yes, sir. Mark? Thank you. Uh, so let's go back to the funding. Uh, yes, sir. We had multiple debates uh, relative to this during our school finance uh, commission, and the the real the, the reality is this though: Would you agree that the state share has continued to decrease since 2007 to where we're at today? It's, yeah, it's very clear that the state share has declined since. And, um, and the difference becomes your analysis of how TEA looks at it versus how LBB looks at it? Uh, I think we actually both classify recapture as state, um, but um, I might be wrong. Um, uh, so LB, LBB doesn't. So, but re even even if you capture, if you uh, track recapture as state, the state share is still declined. So, right. well, if you're th thinking of recapture as local, it's, it's been even more precipitous. Right. Um, so, property, regardless of whether you think of it as state or local share, property taxes as a portion of the school finance system have increased in the load that they are carrying as a revenue source. And, and remind the committee, what did you use for your LAR for property growth this year, and what would you do anything? 6.7? And, and, and 6 to 7 percent um, property value growth. And what did you use relative to the, uh, the uh, uh, growth in, in valuation, meaning the money that would come back from the roughly school. roughly six to seven percent of um in additional funding from property uh, taxes and of course every increase in the way the school finance system is currently legally structured very very simply is let's say we target eighty five hundred dollars per, <laughs> per kid we tell the school districts first collect property taxes and if you collect seven thousand dollars per kid then the state gives you fifteen hundred if you collect nine thousand dollars per kid then the state takes five hundred from you so as property uh, valuations go up and property taxes go up, inherently the state share goes down. That is the way the law is currently designed. Right. And so would it be safe to say that you use $3.5 billion for property growth that just comes back to the state that goes to GR and you use 6.7% relative to property valuation growth uh, to achieve that target, which basically pushes the state share down to 33, 32 yeah, to 33%. It's, it's, it's definitely in the low 30s. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, uh, incidentally, on that front, in, in, in front of you, you have the second annual report uh, produced by TEA on the state of public education. Um, that's a little, should be a little booklet, uh, which looks, unfortunately, I don't have a copy in front of me, but um, should be in front of you. Um, and so that has, there you go. Um, so that has, that covers the, covers the waterfront on public education. It's the same kind of educational landscape stats that I have just covered are in there as well as towards the end is a uh, slide on school finance showing the methods of finance for the, for the states and then um, sort of the 10-year picture. So uh, 
bunch of information in there. Happy to use that at your leisure. And for members of the audience, we should have copies in the back. Um, uh, if you find any typos on that, please don't tell me. Um, so, uh, <laughs> we've already printed them. Um, <laughs> uh, just email me. We'll correct them in the digital version. The, uh, moving on, the, the, the slide nine um, uh, sp now speak to our operational budget. So we are largely a pass-through entity. So you know, when you look at Article Three of the Appropriations Act, um, TEA looks very big um, with a $27.2 billion budget. But as you can see from this little sliced um, bar, um, there are, um, most of that money is, is just administered by our um, grants or school finance team to pass that money on to, to our school districts. The next slide, slide 10, gives a picture of our uh, administrative budget. So about $147 million administrative budget, only $46 million of which is funded by state general revenue. You can kind of see a 10-year trend there for the state general revenue portion of our budget. We have been focused um, in the, the first six months, I'm, I'm now three years and a month on the job. So the first six, six months we spent um, scouring the state, listening to experts to, to identify how to prioritize and focus our work at the agency in support of school systems. And so on slide 11 you see really the tip of that iceberg, um, the key priorities that we are focused on as an agency. So I've tried to organize some of our legislative appropriation requests um, components around that. So on slide 12, you can see our first priority, which is recruiting, supporting, and retaining teachers and principals. We know the data is very clear that the teacher in the classroom has the biggest in-school impact on student outcomes. Um, and you know what we do to love on those who love on our kids um, is pretty darn important. So we have a host of initiatives um, that are uh, trying to address all aspects of the human capital pipeline from recruitment to pre-service support to in-service support to retention. So um, just a high-level overview of some of the riders and, and legislative initiatives that we've tried to align um, uh, towards that work. Our second key uh, priority, uh, slide 13, um, is about making sure um, that in the early grades, in the early years, we establish a strong foundation in reading and math. Um, when you think about it, and again, for uh, I think about half the committee is a former school board member or teacher, um, the, there is a lot of work that happens in middle school and high school to address gaps that have formed in students. It's very expensive, very labor intense, um, and just fundamentally we're, um, we're a lot better off in attacking the achievement gap if we never let it start in the first place. And so our work um, in, uh, with, in pre K, both in school districts and working in partnerships with the sort of private um, uh, child care ecosystem that exists out there, as well as empowering families. Um, the work to have strong curriculum in reading and math. Of course, the reading and math academies that the legislature funds are critical to this work. Um, uh, and, uh, and work uh, related to ensuring that our, our districts have access to the most rigorous instructional material. Um, this, is, um, this is an important part of the component. Um, uh, priority three, you see on slide 14. The other end of the spectrum, these are students that are in high school. Um, you know, I guarantee you somewhere in Texas right now there's a high school student and it's raising his hand or her hand and saying, teacher, when am I ever going to use this? this? So this question of, of relevance and this question of rigor in the high school experience um, is important. And you have high schools all over Texas that are re-engineering themselves um, or, or with initiatives like P-TECH, Early College High School, T-STEM, which the legislature has been very supportive of, um, as well as um, uh, orienting um, their uh, counselors and, and college and career advisors to provide sort of a holistic support, um, advising support to connect kids with what comes next. So, so a slew of initiatives related to that. Um, priority four uh, um, uh, uh, on slide 15 is our work to improve low performing schools. And so, um, a bunch of legislation and, and appropriations um, that we've been engaged in on this. Um, part of this involves our work to support school boards. As a former school board member, um, you know, the, uh, just ensuring that um, we, pr we provide the kind of training and guidance to empower school boards to really um, uh, lead strategically um, their districts, but also the work to uh, identify um, operational weaknesses and help districts create action plans um, to get better faster than, um, than before. Um, uh, I, I can't say enough good things about our service centers um, uh, in this work because they are really an all-hands-on-deck partner um, uh, with uh, so many of our districts, big and small, um, in the work to improve low-performing schools um, around the state. Um, so a host of initiatives there. Slide 16, you know, when you think about those four key strategic priorities, they rest on some pillars. The first pillar is really about performance transparency. Um, we need to know how 
system is doing, how well our kids are doing, um, so that we can craft action plans um, uh, to, to get better next week uh, versus where we are this week. Part of that is, is work like this, to create transparency for policymakers to inform um, them on how the system is working. Part of that is for parents themselves. We've rolled out new um, report card resources about the star is telling them in terms of grade level knowledge and skills and how they can better use that to support their kids. And part of that is the transparency resources of the accountability system um, with, with A through F. Commissioner. Yes, sir. Representative King. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Commissioner, I was just, um, since we got to A through F, I was just curious. You know, we had a lot of debate last session, particularly about three through eight on yes. A through F because we have very little little to, me to measure. You would agree with that? Yeah, we have we have grade level knowledge and skills as, as reported by the multiple star assessments, but much beyond that, we don't have anything um, right. centrally. Now the districts have a host of metrics that they can use, which is why um, uh, y'all uh, in House Bill 22 adopted this local accountability exactly. component, so that they could add additional metrics that they have access to that we don't collect in Austin. Okay, but one thing that you were working on last session was trying to come up with some criteria that could be measured state across the state for three through for extracurriculars in particular, which we think is a high probability of success. Um, we just have to sort of define what counts and and think about the rulemaking and data collection process, which doesn't currently exist. Exactly. So, for for it to exist, do you um, have any idea how how far off? we are to, to where we could actually implement something. My sense you know, is... the whole goal uh, is to make the test from, count from for an, as little yeah, as possible. From an implementation perspective, I would say that... Uh, so th we're in this, we're in the in, in 1920 academic, no, we're in the 1819 academic cycle right now. I would say f f four years from today, it would be part of the actual live A through F system. We might be able to do it a little bit faster than that, but... Um, we, you know, we generally sort of, we have to create the reporting system first. We have to kind of look at what the data tells us, make sure there's no sure. sort of weirdness in it, and then we go live. And we generally, um, um, we try not to sort of surprise educators as much as possible. It's a, it's a goal, not necessarily a hard and fast reality. Sure. Um, but um, uh, we would want it to be up and running in a way that people could have some degree of predictive um, um, a, approach and then they could adjust operationally before it goes live. So that's why I think we're probably um, uh, about four years from the current academic cycle. Um, uh, it would be part of the A through F system for three through eight. Okay, thank you. That's what I needed. I wish we could move faster than that, but it's a big, complicated state. Um, uh, so moving beyond um, sort of transparency of reporting and performance management, um, uh, you have uh, our second key sort of foundational element is just regulatory and statutory compliance um, um, of particular interest is statutory compliance with IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, so we have come up with an, uh, a, a, a fairly robust strategic plan to, to improve capacity supports in the area of special education. Um, and our, um, we're not at the end, we're not at the beginning of the end, we are, uh, I don't even think we're at the end of the beginning, but we are, we're moving uh, as quickly as possible on that five-year process of a significant investment in our educators and our systems related to diagnostic capacity, differentiation capacity. Um, uh, we are moving um, rapidly, um, but that is also a big battleship to turn. Just, yes, sir. Justin Porter is going to be up talking to us later. Yes. Uh, after probably we get back from session. Um, you know, I don't know if you have the answer or where it's at, but what do we expect the cost of that to go to this year? We just don't know yet. Uh, yeah, we, we know that we, our trend lines are up in terms of participation. So the last data point was 9.2%, which was the year before the current year. Um, and that's up from a, a bottoming out of 86 um, so I would anticipate that participation rates can, will continue to climb, and as a result, the costs associated with that and the formulas will continue to rise. I don't think, like I saw some news that were based on our sort of conservative estimates that were about $3 billion for this by any. I don't think it's going to be that. Um, I think it's going to be a little less than that. Um, it could be noticeably left, but I'll, I'll defer that to Leo and Justin um, uh, later on. Um, the th third key enabler is just our own organizational capacity, um, both internally and with our service centers. Um, uh, we can't say enough good thing about the work that happens in service centers. You know, you know, there's, there's no hurricane recovery without service centers. There's, there's a lot of things that the service centers are carrying a heavy, heavy load with. But uh, we're, we're also um, uh, addressing just basic infrastructural capacity. So fiber optics cables, for example, right now are 
basically everywhere. Um, so um, we're on pace so that 99% of school systems would have fiber optics to their door. That doesn't mean that 99% of schools, but 99% of school systems would be. Um, and we continue to invest pretty significantly in protecting the privacy of um, the data that's in those systems from the many Russian hackers that are interested in uh, disrupting our lives. So um, um, moving on past that, part of our legislative appropriations request, we had a couple of exceptional items. One was in the area of safe and, safe and healthy schools. Um, I am uh, very thankful that the House introduced bill has fully funded that particular exceptional item. I'm happy to discuss that in more detail, but, but that covers a variety of of issues including mental health supports, including um, physical asset hardening, and including um, connecting um, school systems with resources in the communities um, um, uh, related to, to, to safety, as well as supporting the best practice recommendations that came out of the Secret Service on how to keep schools safe. Um, uh, as well, our, our second exceptional item was also fully funded in the House Introduced Budget. Thank you, um, uh, uh, um, thank you very much um, uh, for the, the support. And that is about uh, compensatory services, so um, creating um, support for acceleration if there's a student that um, comes forward that says, I really needed special ed supports two or three years ago but haven't gotten it. This is a, a, a funding bucket that's, that's for that particular need um, as it arises. Um, and then slide 24, we also are the pass-through for Wyndham School District that has a, an exceptional item related to increasing their programs, which have a significant effect on recidivism. So I think they're very worthy of consideration. Um, slide 25 just um, highlights some writer um, requests that we made. Many of them were made in the introduced budget, um, which is both unusual and appreciated. Um, chief among them stuff that allows us to do our special education work. Um, and with that, let me pause for a second. I was going to transition to a different topic, um, uh, which was um, a beginning a, a conversation about assessments. But let me just pause and see if there's any other questions on that before I transition. Members, any questions? Yes. Practices by the Secret Service. Do yes, sir. Additional detail on what those best practices are. Kind of a absolutely. What that um, like. So um, you know, uh, so the governor convened the, this sort of brain trust after uh, the shooting at Santa Fe, um, and I learned a ton from that. Um, uh, and in fact, I reflect even as a school board member. I was a school board member when Sandy Hook happened, and I really regret not having been exposed to this then. So the Secret Service and the Federal Department of Education came together, and they um, came up with practice recommendations um, related to um, um, a threat assessment um, technique, assessment protocols, um, which – uh, it's very Secret service -y language, but it, what you really think of it is, do you have relationships with all your kids? Do you have, are you gathering information on what they're telling you? And then when you see that Mike's say, you know, two, uh, a month ago his uncle committed suicide, and uh, a, a week ago he wrote a paper that was kind of squirrely, and then today Mike's best friend said Mike's acting weird today at the school. Like, do you have, do you have a system in place? to identify that, to react to it, and then to case manage Mike on a go-forward basis. That's really what it's about. So um, uh, what we need to do is project management um, uh, supports, because the staff are there in school districts to sort of identify this. You just need a convener for this um, uh, um, that can react to this. And then you need to help connect school districts with case management resources, be they private practitioners or in some, you know, extreme cases, referral to residential facilities. So that's what that's about, is, this, is standing up that capacity support. Because um, what we don't want, what, what I would caution against is imposing a new statutory requirement um, these practices on school districts without giving them some resources with which to implement the statutory requirement. So this was really us asking for some resources um, related to implementation support. So, so just to touch on that, I know that, that there's, there's multiple mental health bills, school safety bills, but one of the things we did learn, I think you would agree on this, and I think maybe you're referencing is uh, additional counselors, we're, we're about 50% of where we need to be on that, right? Yeah, I think that's right. I, I would defer to um, uh, one of my other um, testifiers later, Lily Locks, who's okay. a, a bit more of an expert on that. But yes, we are, we are woefully under what the National Counseling Association uh, posits as a best practice in terms of staffing. Okay. Um, and let me go back to a couple quick things before you're moving on. I don't know what you're moving on to. But. Uh, assessment. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let me, let's go back over to Hurricane Harvey. Yes, sir. So 
do we have final numbers yet or where we're at or is that somebody else is going to talk about that later or because I don't want to steal somebody else's thunder um, in the very end of the appendix of this presentation there's there's current data but the short answer to your question is we are not we the dust yet has not yet settled um, both physically and metaphorically um, so in March We'll have, I think, a final a picture of what the impact is on property value and property collections in the current academic year. Um, we anticipated that between a $500 million and $1 billion hole that would be opened up in local school district budgets. This gets back to our school finance conversation. You know, we ask people to collect property taxes first, and the state makes you, makes you a hole on that. What is not well understood is there's actually a one-year lag in that process. Certainly our school finance commission members explored this in detail because they've recommended eliminating that hole. That would actually permanently solve these funding problems caused by natural disasters as an aside. Um, but um, it will require um, uh, the legislature to fill that hole. Otherwise, school districts are going to have to lay more people off um, uh, because they have huge temporary holes um, created. And, and so any permanent hole. It is a hole that is created one year that now the next year, the funding that comes from the state recognizes that hole, but you never filled the hole it's back. Per, it's a permanent hole in the sense that the state has to make up the difference for the rest yeah, of the Yeah, it's a, it's a permanent one-time hole. So like I said, the state never fills the hole back for the 18-19 um, school year. And the Unless already, there's a supplemental appropriation. Sure, I understand. And then so the, um, uh, the damage to schools do we have that number yet do we know what that is so the uh, uh, unfortunately no we don't have any better estimates than we did uh, many moons ago which is roughly 900 million dollars in damage to schools um, uh, theoretically fema and insurance should be covering about 90 percent of that which means that the exposure to the foundation school program would be about 90 million dollars um, and we don't have any better estimate than that i actually don't anticipate that estimate getting much better um, for 12 to 24 months because school districts are still dealing with insurance and FEMA. Do, do you know what's in the supplemental? Uh, we have uh, we have a survey closing at the end of the week on facilities damage. We have, uh, we have closing at the end of the week on facilities damage, so we'll probably have a, a better estimate than that $900 million. Uh, So um, currently in the supplemental, I'm not sure this was specifically earmarked, but LBB is very well aware of that and has had conversations with the lead appropriators on this. It, oh, so there was, I'm sorry. Um, there was the equivalent of, of, an, of at least the 90 million, because 60 million is a direct appropriation and 30 million is offset by recapture abatements. Okay, and um, all right, so you're gonna ask for that in the supplemental. The other thing is there were school districts that did appropriation, not appropriations, reappraisals yes. of their districts and under the premise that we would pay them back? Yes. Um, where is that money at in the, in the um, budget? Leo, you just wanna come and sit down? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love Mike, but you know he actually knows what he's doing. Uh, yeah, over there, so, I, uh, clearly we, yeah, yeah. we we understand that. So, good morning, Leo Lopez, Chief School Finance Officer for TEA. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's my understanding that uh, 12 districts reappraise their properties, their 2017 property values, and um, it's my understanding that in the current school year, their reappraised values were submitted to TEA as part of the property value study in in the summer. So most of that money, uh, which you have here on the slide. Uh, we estimated it was about $150 million hit to the FSP, has already been incorporated into the current payments that we're, that we're issuing. Right, but they also had to pay they for, had yes, they yes. had to pay for the appraisal. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's true. So where is that money? That wouldn't be accounted for okay, in the FSP so formulas. we figure that out and make sure that we have that as a request when you sit down because they need to get paid back? Absolutely. So we'll, we'll add that to our calculus and make sure that we communicate that um, to LBB so they can be considered as part of the supplemental. And you also have uh, various CADs that were out there. I know HCAD, because in, 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 I think some of the biggest ones were in Houston that were redone. Yep. Uh, and I know HCAD uh, ate a bunch of expenditure, a bunch of expense as well. So. Make sure we reach out to HCAD. I met with their chief appraiser, and uh, they're yeah, upside that, down. They're upside down uh, several million dollars on that as well. And uh, those will be those will be bills. I would assume that they would pass forward to the school districts if they haven't already. Well, no, they ate part of the cost, but we just need to make sure that it's it's done correctly. But I know that the school districts have eaten several millions of dollars in the reappraisal process. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that would be in the comptroller shop we'll, we'll 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 do some research on figuring out well we just want to make sure that we treat them the same as we treated uh uh hurricane ike uh, victims which was you know galveston texas city and those guys that yep. they, they did did do reappraisals and they were paid for by the state yes sir because we've asked them we you know they asked us if we would pay them back and we said that we would okay okay yes sir 
All right, go ahead. Uh, thank you, members. So let me transition to the next set of slides that you have in front of you that starts with Texas um, Summit and Interim Assessments, you can see there. So um, the um, slide two is actually a, um, kind of a useful visual aid to describe this, the pantheon of assessments. Um, uh, and um, there's a lot of information to digest on this particular slide, but I'm going to take just a moment to talk through this. Um, the, um, you know, we, we spend, as, a, as policymakers, certainly we as an agency, spend a great deal of time talking about star and end-of-year summative assessments that have accountability stakes tied to them. But there are a lot more assessments that happen in, um, in our schools. And what I would say after having talked to lots and lots of teachers is that there, there really is no learning without some kind of assessment. Um, if you have spoken to a group of students, if you're working with a group of students, you want to know, did they learn the knowledge and skill that you were, you were teaching in that capacity? So this is why teachers have pop quizzes and they've got, you know, checking for understanding as kids walk out the door. This is a constant activity. Um, it doesn't, um, in many ways, it's not obtrusive, um, uh, but it's part of, of a good practice of verifying that students are learning and then differentiating instruction along the way. On the bottom bar, these are formative assessments that um, look and feel, they're, they're not necessarily multiple choice tests, they look and feel very different than what we think of as end of, end of year assessment, but it is part of the learning process. They, they generally don't have any stakes from the state perspective, but in many cases they have stakes because the, they'll be part of the grade book and that sort of thing. As you move up the spectrum, you can see um, the nature of the assessments change um, uh, from very narrow topics to very broad array of topics, a very low externally imposed stakes to very high externally imposed stakes. And this gets us all the way up to STAR um, at the end of the year, or say SAT or ACT, which is certainly a high stakes uh, uh, test for all, uh, all involved, the AP exams, these kinds of things. So um, I just wanted to provide that because I thought it was useful context um, as we make sense of, of all that we hear constantly from, from practitioners out in the field. So um, uh, with regard to STAR itself, slide three. So the STAR program is um, three through eight reading and math, um, uh, then it's four and seven writing, it's five and eight science, it's eight social studies, um, and then in high school, at the end of course exams are English one, English two, algebra one, which is actually also in eighth grade, biology and U.S. history. That is what's um, part of the STAR, the core STAR uh, program. Um, uh, most of those are also required by the federal government, not necessarily all of them. Um, and then we also have two optional assessments that are being administered by a, a smaller and smaller number of districts. Um, English 3 and Algebra 2. Um, there's a bunch of statutory limitations on how districts can use those particular assessments. Um, so there's, there's not too many takers on it. Start, um, slide 4 um, shows um, just uh, different touch points for different assessments that we support at the agency. So there's a December administration for EOCs. Think, um, say, seniors that they're trying to get um, EOCs that they um, might have failed in, as a freshman and are just continuing to take, um, take those assessments. Tell pass. this is how we um, uh, assess English language proficiency for our native, um, uh, not English, uh, not native English speakers. Um, the alternative two, these are um, a, a completely different type of assessments for students that are um, significantly cognitively um, um, uh, disabled. Um, the, um, uh, and then you have uh, the, the, the rest of the STAR tests, which most people are more familiar with. Um, there is a video that I can't click on this sheet of paper and show you, but on slide five, um, there's a video called How the, um, that we've tried to create on our website. We have a, a, a website that we've added resources to called texasassessment.com that it essentially tries to explain a lot of this stuff. Like, how does the STAR get built, literally? How, does, how is it designed? Um, uh, you know, what, what do you use the STAR test for? What should you not use the STAR test for? Um, these kinds of things. So we've, we've stood up these. These videos are fairly short, three minutes. Would recommend that you... Um, you know, in your moments of downtime, which I know are extensive with members of the legislature, if, uh, that you would uh, check out those, um, some of those videos. Um, but slides six and seven actually get at the heart of what we're talking about because I think we, we lose sight of the, the, of the sort of the principles um, that are built into this. Um, at its core, y'all, the legislature, has adopted a moral um, belief system um, in our um, public school um, accountability system, which is that all children, regardless of their background, regardless of where they live, regardless of what their parents you know, look like, um, 
that all children can learn and achieve at high levels. And you ask the State Board of Education to really define what that means. And so they specifically define um, bits of knowledge that we think all kids can learn. So like in third grade, one of our expectations is that all third graders have memorized their times tables. And we don't have a different expectation for kids in Dumas versus kids in Dallas. All third, kid, all third graders should have memorized their times tables. Um, you see on slide six a very explicit description of what one of those um, student expectations are. So SBOE says, um, in third grade math, um, multiply a two-digit number by a one-digit number. Um, you need to know how to do that. And so then down at the bottom, you see that's a star question that is aligned to that particular bit of knowledge or skill. So a baseball league bought nine boxes of baseballs. That's a one-digit number. Each box contained 36 baseballs. That's a two-digit number. So what's the answer? That's what we're talking about. So the STAR test is designed to tell us whether kids have, have mastered the, the, the expectations that the SBOE has crafted based upon um, the belief system that the legislature has adopted that all kids can, in fact, um, learn this. Um, uh, and, you know, the reality is it's really difficult to, to make sure that all kids have learned these skills. Um, this is what makes teaching so hard, what makes leading school systems so hard, um, because not everybody walks into the classroom with the same background. Um, um, uh, my kids will have been exposed to a lot of training by me on this beforehand. So, ben Deaver has a question. So, and, uh, so slide seven is the same concept, but in, in English. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the sample question you just, you just read, uh, I think it would be appropriate to point out that not only does the third grader need to uh, have to be able to multiply a two-digit number oh, like by one-digit number. other things, too. They also have to be able to read that question and, and know what the question is asking them to do. And so it's, I think it's important that we recognize that not only is it meeting the, the TEKS uh, for math, but we are also, we, we, I, think, I think we have to be cognizant that it's on grade level for reading as well. Absolutely. Yeah, t totally agree. We have, um, um, uh, I, I heard consistent concerns several years ago on a whole bunch of things related to item development um, uh, and the, the appropriateness, the grade level appropriateness of item development. So over the last three years, we've um, um, significantly modified our item development processes to add multiple quality control checks that just didn't exist, say, four years ago. Um, we have, a, uh, for example, we stood up an external teacher review committee so that every single item, um, um, after having gone through all the other processes, is reviewed by a set of current um, practicing teachers for uh, grade level appropriateness. Where we can do Lexile analysis, which is limited because you have to have sufficient density of text to do that, we now do a Lexile analysis to make sure that uh, all of the reading material is appropriate um, uh, from Alexile. That was a practice that just wasn't done um, previously. Uh, and um, we have a teacher institute that it, we've also stood up so that in the summer we bring 200 practicing teachers and they wrench on all the items that go under development um, and sort of edit them, filter them down, make sure that they're grade level appropriate. So th we've, we've substantially improved over the last three years the quality control processes on item development just to make sure that the test continues to be as fair and accurate a representation of the state as possible. Um, there, 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 I would say there's nothing there's nothing perfect, um, uh, but our, our job is to try to continuously improve so that as criticisms are raised about the assessment that we can be responsive to those and make it better and better um, um, for, for, for all parties involved. Well, I, and I appreciate that. And I, you know, I know my experience has been that the, the frustration that a math teacher might feel that has been drilling that child and, and, and is confident that child knows how to do that math problem, but because of the child's what, whatever uh, causes the child not to be able to read and interpret the question, they miss the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, we worked with a, um, one of our initiatives is an initiative that we refer to as lesson study, which is this deeply reflective practice that teachers engage in to analyze all aspects of a student education, or student expectation, and, and reflect, and, and then design really a perfect lesson around it. And I remember talking to some teachers from Leander. Um, uh, they were first grade math teachers about how do they um, determine whether the students have really mastered the given concept um, that they're focused on. And, and this 
this particular case, the student expectation was about um, adding um, two or more numbers to get to 10, sort of the foundational um, expectation for decimal mathematics. And they built a formative assessment framework that included blocks. The kids would move blocks around, pictures where kids were like moving and manipulating pictures, and then written equations. Um, and what they, could, what they saw is that different students uh, could master different parts of those, but not necessarily all of them. Um, and they began adjusting instructional practices from that. So, I mean, I think what is incumbent upon us is improving the supports that we provide to teachers um, to give them as, as many resources as possible um, to, to do this kind of work. And then also to make sure that the end of your assessment that sort of um, 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 identifies sort of overall mastery of, of all the concepts is again as fair um, as possible um, given all factors involved. An another factor that we've, we've begun doing but we're not perfect on is cross-curricular alignment. Like ideally you don't have a reading passage that is say some civics or social studies text that is related to a social studies concept that they haven't yet gotten to. Um, so you would want to be as thoughtful as possible on all of that assessment design process. It's really hard to do this well, um, but we are trying to improve our assessment design as much as possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'll skip the reading example, but there's an English language arts example similar. On slide eight is an example of a star report card. We, again, we've tried to provide resources to parents to tell them this is what the student knew, but this is also how much the student grew academically. Um, this is a very new um, sort of communications feature for parents. Um, and what's more important for me is like, you, you know, you go to the doctor and the doctor's like, yeah, your, your arm's broken. So, well, what do I do about that? Like how, so we wanted to make sure that we give resources to parents to better support their kids in reading and math as well. So there's a, a, a bunch of resources we've been standing up um, related to um, trying to empower parents to make use of these results and then, and then do something Thing with it um, uh, and again we're, it's a journey of continuous improvement it's not not perfect yet um, I spoke um, slide nine a little bit about this in, in answer to your questions representative uh, Van Dever on uh, the new teacher institutes that have been started on item development um, the work that we're doing on um, your writing pilot which I think is actually very important work I can't emphasize enough for this committee um, to, to think about the sort of next generation and iterative design improvements for how assessment could work in this portfolio writing assessment that um, Representative Van Dever's championed is is very worthy of R&D development um, uh, for the state because it will have an improvement on instructional quality. Um, and then, of course, the e external educator committees. Um, uh, uh, slide 10 um, uh, is, is just, again, a highlight. There, a few years back, there was a next generation, there was a commission on next generation assessment and, and accountability. And we've been working on implementing several of their recommendations. Um, uh, so this is just a highlight on, on a few of them. And then slide 11 was just some statutory options for you to consider possible additional improvements to the STAR. So um, we think um, it is worthy of us to consider rather than having like a three-hour sit down for a third grader at the end of the year, maybe let's split the STAR up into chunks so they can be done in 45-minute blocks over you know, a couple weeks. Um, it's a less intense um, and, and, um, and um, uh, administration environment for the assessment. It would require statutory authorization uh, to support and a little bit of appropriation for us to build it out properly. Um, but, um, but this would be a potential improvement. That would also give us some, some other ancillary benefits. There's been bills that have been filed this legislative session that basically say, hey, we want to get rid of the STAR test. Yes, sir. Parents are like, oh, my God, that's so great. Let's just do that. Everybody needs to do it. Can you explain why we can't do that? Well, there's a variety of reasons, but um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start with um, there's, a, there's $2 billion uh, at stake because if we don't have a STAR test, we will definitely be out of compliance with federal law, and it... Um, we will lose all of our ESSA money, which is about a billion nine per year. It's actually, um, I think, listed in here. And there is some argument that we would also then lose all of our IDEA funding, potentially all of our school lunch funding, all of our Perkins funding. Um, so that's one reason. Um, uh, there are others. Um, uh, there, um, as uh, Representative King pointed out earlier, at, the, at least in grades three through eight, we don't have any other measures for accountability, so that would be the end of uh, a public school accountability system as well. And the, and the evidence that we have uh, from the study of the accountability system back in the late 90s was that they, um, some, some researchers would find a, a low-performing student in, say, an exemplary rated school and then a low-performing student in an unacceptable school. And what they found was that 
the accountability pressure caused these students to end up making more money at 25 years of age than these students. But, but in simplistic terms, we went from No Child Left Behind which to, is, ESSA. to ESSA, but we do have some tests that are optional. That's correct. That we there's have within our system. There's and I know four or so. Representative Van Deaver's tried, and, and I've tried, and we've tried multiple times. So there's ways to, there's ways to make it better. Absolutely. But the reality is, is that having a piece of legislation that says we're getting rid of all star testing is, 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 is not, we can't do it. Yeah, the, the, so in fifth and eighth grade, for example, we place stakes on students as a, at a state legislative level to pass the tests. Um, that, that's not required by federal law. That could clearly not, um, it's not a requirement. Our EOCs, we require three out of five to graduate, and actually that's sunsets, so we'll, if, unless laws change, we'd require five out of five. That's also not a federal requirement. That's just something that we require, so that's not, um, uh, st strictly speaking, necessary. Um, and then the four or five uh, assessments that we do in addition to the ESSA requirements um, uh, are not um, either. So if, if you wanted to um, phase those out, you could do as well. Um, again, all of these have other policy considerations even besides federal law because if you don't have a social studies test, that means you don't have social studies incorporated in the accountability system in 3 through 8, and therefore the accountability system is a little narrowly, more narrowly focused. So these are all considerations that are worthy of policy discussion. Uh, I have some of that highlighted in the appendix section in this assessment. Um, there are also cost-saving measures, like if we didn't do five and eight student-level um, uh, assessments, we wouldn't have to test them three times, and so we could cut down the costs there. So, so, so Commissioner, next week, I know you, you have a stop here coming up in a couple of minutes. Um, next week, um, I, I think we would like to dig in a little bit more on accountability, House Bill 22. Yes, sir higher level because the, the, we're trying to set the table for, for some of the recommendations, which is that the majority of our third graders can't read. Um, and th those are just facts. Those are not, not you know, throwing stones. Those are just factually uh, accurate uh, issues, but we need to go through that. Um, I know there were some issues in the implementation of House Bill 22 um, that we'd like to discuss with you yes, next sir. week specifically. I know you have some of your staff here, but I think that the committee would like to have that conversation with you. Uh, and we'd like to go back and dig into uh, more of these kind of high-level star recommendations on testing because I know that, uh, you know, people are expecting us to kind of look at this at, yes, at some point. I, I don't believe we're interested in having a complete rewrite of, uh, of the A through F or accountability system, but I think there's some fixes that need to be addressed, and we'd like to talk to you um, about those issues. Uh, the other thing I'd like you to be prepared to talk about uh, next week, if you don't mind, is... Um, uh, the uh, uh, changes in 1842, uh, specifically, yes. uh, I want I want us to to be able to talk about uh, some of the schools that we have that are in trouble, uh, and and maybe potentially if there's some additional options that we can provide to you because you really have limited options right now okay. relative two choices you have two choices yeah. you either close the school or board of managers right? yes sir um, so those are those are those are the options. Um, and then lastly, uh, and I don't know if somebody's going to address this or not, but uh, I really would like to understand uh, on the TEKS, uh, you know, we had Senate Bill 313 two legislative sessions ago um, that basically required that the TEKS would be completed by now. They're not. Uh, and I'd like to understand why. Yes, sir. Uh, we uh, have, and there's some slides in the appendix on the progress to streamline the TEKS. So, um, and, and, but our, and, and, and I think this is not uh, this is not uh, hidden. But the state, some, several of the state board of education members are the ones that lobbied to have that bill vetoed, and um, uh, as a result of that, but it would have forced all the TEKS to be done by now, and they're not. And so, I'd like to have some understanding of why that is. As their secretary, I am happy to, to provide as much context as I can. And uh, you should provide that to us because I think there's members on this committee that are not very happy about that. Yes, sir. Understood. Um, well, happy to come back then next week and cover those three and any additional topics. Um, and again, sorry I, I wasn't able to stay longer today. I okay. normally adjust my schedule around y'all. Um, okay. um, we have, there are some more slides related to assessment that um, uh, periodically folks ask about the cost of the assessment. So you can see on slides 12 and there's some information about the sort of overall cost and then you need to go so let's dig into it next week you, you bet. We have we'll have plenty of time we have plenty of time thank you so. thank you sir thank, thank you. you members okay uh, I think what we'll do is we'll bring up Jamie Crow executive director of performance reporting Jamie come on up 
let you go through your presentation and then we'll probably have a stop so people can get to the floor. We'll see how, how long is your presentation going to be, uh, Jamie? Probably no more than 20 minutes. Okay. Good morning to you all. My name is Jamie Crow. I'm the Executive Director of Performance Reporting at the agency. Um, I wanted to just briefly go over the accountability system. Um, uh, we've touched on a lot of the information already with the Commissioner's presentation this morning and questions that have been asked, but um, you have the slide packet in front of you. Um, basically, uh, as, as mentioned, House Bill 22 and the 85th legislation uh, put into place the A through F accountability system, um, and that is uh, a key feature because uh, it changes our system from a sort of pass-fail system to an A through F system. Um, went through a very extensive stakeholder feedback and uh, information gathering process over the last two years prior to the system implementation. On slide two, you can see the different groups that we met with numerous times. Um, and then there's a, an area on the slide that basically shows you a kind of a megaphone. And that's areas where we took into account uh, feedback from the public when we're making final decisions on the system itself. Uh, the new system requires us to have labels of A through F. Um, slide four, I think, represents uh, a description of each of those and what um, an expectation is for the A, B, C, D, or F. On slide five, uh, we wanted to make sure we had two very distinct philosophical approaches to this. One is that we don't have any sort of force distribution. Um, in the old system that we had, uh, traditionally on an annual basis, we would go back in and sort of determine the lowest 5% for some of the different indexes that we used. This system doesn't do that. We establish targets and we want those targets to stay in place. The other thing that we want to do is maintain um, rules and consistency for a period of up to five years. We understand that there's various things that happen in the system, um, legislative changes or uh, changes in curriculum, things like that, that might warrant a change in something, but our goal is to try to maintain over a period of years um, the same targets, the same rules, so that we can show um, uh, improvement and, and districts are able to gauge for themselves and for their campuses um, continuous improvement. There's three domains in the new system. Uh, we look at student achievement, school progress, and closing the gaps. Uh, our system sets up 70% of the grade coming from the better of the closing the gaps, um, excuse me, the uh, student achievement domain and the school progress domain, and 30% of the, the grade coming from closing the gaps. And as the commissioner had mentioned earlier, uh, we wanted to make sure that the ratings that we put out are very easy to understand. Um, so we developed last year our first um, A through F report card. Um, it's located at txschools.gov. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how many folks on the committee have had a chance to look at it, but it's a very uh, a good overview of the accountability system and it allows parents to have a very good understanding of, of where their child's school or the district that they attend um, have, have information. Jamie, I think Representative Gonzalez has a question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you very much. I just have a question for clarity. When the initial was originally done, there was concerns about the force distribution that no matter what happened, there would be schools that would be ranked. Not necess I mean, they, may, they might still be struggling, but it would force struggling schools. But just for clarity, there is no force distribution. So should all of our schools kind of meet these standards, we could in essence all have a a ranking schools. That's correct. That's um, correct. That's great. I think what I could, what I would love for the committee to know is I don't think I think our goal should be having all rank a ranking schools. I think the tension sometimes in creating public policy is that oh if we have all a ranking schools maybe our school system maybe our assessments aren't strict enough and therefore and there's this balance between having accurate and um, strict assessments but also having the goal of everybody being there, correct? Correct. And how do you find that balance? Well, I, I think when we went through the process, um, when we reevaluate probably in a couple more years, because we'll be into the third or fourth year of the system, we'll go back and look and see, okay, if, if we're having a lot of A's, um, maybe we're achieving some initial goals that we have with the system, maybe we need to go back and reevaluate our goals. Um, maybe the, the assessments need to be looked at to, to maintain rigor, to make sure that students are um, achieving what we want them to achieve. 
Um, it, it is a constant process that we have to go through. But I think if we do a thing where we reset the goals every single year to just make sure we're maintaining 5%, that doesn't allow districts any time, any way to innovate, to try to, try to get themselves to um, doesn't show parents that the, these districts are having any chance to improve. Um, and that's, that's really our goal behind it. We just want to make sure that um, there's an understanding that we are going to always have to go back and evaluate and make sure that it's not too easy. It's not like, um, you know, uh, uh, having way too many A's in a, in a specific class for whatever reason. We always want to go back and reevaluate that, and we plan on doing Sorry, and I guess I'm, I'm curious as, as as to your plans and how you create that methodology to ensure that the, the goalposts aren't being changed without there being some 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 conversations with the educators and throughout the state, and that and there's just again that balance. You know, I would love for all the schools to get an A, and I don't think that's a bad thing, right? right? I mean, that should be our goal. But again, moving the standards, elevating the standards always, but in a, in a way that communicates back. Yeah, we, we always have a, every year part of our process is we have an annual or at least once a year we meet a, with a technical and policy advisory committee that's made up of superintendents, um, business leaders, that sort of thing. Um, we always will review the, the outcomes with them and we will, um, if, if there's a request for it or if there's a nece necessity for it, we will model <laughs> outcomes for future to, to give them an idea. So we try to get educators and stakeholders involved in the process as much as possible. Um, when we set this system up, we wanted to make sure that we were meeting some very high level physical, um, requirements like the 60 by 30 plan that the coordinating board has. We want to make sure that um, if, we, if somebody's getting an A, that the majority of their students are achieving um, a post-secondary readiness or being ready to go on to get a degree or certificate. That was one of the main goals we had in this. And our, our uh, website that we put out also um, when you're able to dig into the details about things and stuff like that it gives you descriptions of what those particular letter grades mean um, what does an exemplary rating mean what is what is that as a high level we met with a group of folks um, ESC's uh, superintendents and got together and it came across some common language that we wanted to be sure was available for everybody to be able to differentiate the letter grades and what they meant so, you're welcome um, so uh, the slide eight starts with the 2017-18 results. Um, you can see that uh, the first slide talks about districts. Districts were the first uh, group to get letter grades. Uh, campuses will receive letter grades this year with the 2019 accountability ratings. Um, when we get to the next slide, you'll see some, some letter grades. Those are based off the scale scores that we use. So um, we had about, we had 153 camp, uh, districts receive A's and 16 districts receive F's. Um, one thing we wanted to emphasize is that student poverty is not a strong factor in how districts were rated. Uh, if we did a correlation on the overall ratings to uh, free and reduced price lunch, that correlation was 0.4. That's, that's a moderate correlation. Um, the, the, if, if you look below, you can see each of the different domains and what the correlations are for each of those. Jamie, uh, Representative Brunel has a question. Yes, sir. Hi. Thank Good you. Morning. Um, on, on this slide, uh, two questions. One is, it may not have a strong relationship, but it does have a moderate one. Sure. And so, first, for the 259, is there a way to tease out which of the are magnet schools, choice schools, uh, special purpose campuses? Uh, we have a designation that comes through. Um, it's a, it's a self-reported designation. Right. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to. There's nothing officially that comes through the PEAMS system that we use to identify those campuses. But we can use like the the name of the school. Uh, a lot of times, they'll have words like early college or uh, leadership academy, something like that. I'd, I'd be curious about that. Okay. Um, just because you can imagine, you can have a, a high poverty district that has choice schools or magnet schools. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, our special purpose programs, uh, and I'd just be interested to see what that looks like. I'm not inferring it one way or the other, but sure. it's interesting. But on the on the inverse, um, do we have the distribution for IR campuses? In other words, um, do we know whether for IR campuses whether the distribution is the same, or if most or all IR campuses are high poverty schools? Um, 
we we can to answer the first question we can find that out for you the the information that you're wanting about the, the 259 if you I, I think you're referring to the the slide on the uh, page or slide number 12 that uh, highlights that there were 259 campuses that were high poverty 80 percent or higher and then 100 or defining high poverty is, is over 50 percent actually it's over 80 percent okay because the state the state averages 50 I believe 52 percent so we're considering high poverty here 80 percent or higher and so yet to answer your qu second question yes we can we could tease those out and find out uh, we could tell you the exact numbers for the IRs. Yeah, I'd be and the curious about the IRS schools, yes. and then and then just just so I'm clear, and I could, the chairman knows that this is not my strong suit. If you go back to slide 10, there's a slide that says large, high-performing, high-poverty districts, but the eco dis numbers are, some of them are in the 50s and the 70s. So those those are or aren't high poverty. The the high poverty uh, as we defined it, as you see it on slide 12, is 80 percent or higher. But the for slide 10, these are just a combination of large um, or moderate sized campuses with high percent above the state average, essentially um, uh, economically disadvantaged. So high poverty is high poverty is 80. And then in slide 10, you're just giving us examples to compare them to. Exactly. Yes. Got it. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you, Chairman. So we move on. Um, next page basically shows you the campus breakouts. I mentioned campuses didn't receive letter grades um, in 2018. They will in 2019. But uh, we basically looked at the number or percentage of campuses that had the, the traditional grade ranges of uh, you know zero to six, zero to 59 was an F. Anything in the bands of 60, 70, 80, 90 were A's, B's, C's, and D's. And you can see the breakout there. Uh, again, there's a moderate correlation of student poverty to uh, these outcomes. And there's about 260 campuses that had 80% or higher poverty that uh, did got an A in the system. And there were about 170 that um, had very low poverty that did not get an A. So we just want to make sure that, that's, that folks are aware of that correlation. Um, briefly, to go over the design details, is familiar with the system uh, as I mentioned before there's three domains student achievement is is the first one in that uh, area we look for elementary and middle schools as mentioned uh, at star outcomes and then for high schools we look at star outcomes along with college career military readiness indicators as well as graduation rates and uh, those particular elements are weighted for high schools as 40% based off STAR, 40% off of college career military readiness, and 20% for graduation rates. Jamie, real quick, uh, yes, sir. the question was asked earlier, Commissioner Morath, about, and I think Representative King was asking it, um, when do you expect the uh, uh, additional uh, items to be available for STAR 338? Because all we're doing is basically right. you know, looking at a test. I mean, That's right. How quickly, I mean, are you more bullish on getting it done quicker or, you, or or do you think that, you know, we're still looking three to four years? I think we can definitely get some recommendations done within the next year. And that's the, the, the purpose behind the bill was to, to get a, a group of folks together and make some recommendations on how what particular indicators to look at, how to gather that information. The hard part is being able to get it statewide and, and get it into the to the system so that we can use it. That'll be the one that takes the right amount of time. I, I think uh, four years is uh, uh, probably, I, I think three years could probably be a better, more conservative way. We have till 2022 is according to the legislation to, to provide something to the legislature if the commission, commissioner opts not to implement it before then. So uh, I would hope that by the end of the year, we have an idea of what we could gather um, and the feasibility of it. And then uh, we'd use the next year to two years to try to implement and get the data and then fully implement. I think th I agree with the commissioner that we want to make sure that this isn't a, a, a throw it right at districts right away. They have an opportunity to sort of report only for a year and then um, give them a chance to to get up to speed with it. Okay. Okay. And then, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on slide 17, it basically outlines the college ready, career ready, and military ready indicators that we have. Um, there's criteria for APIB exams, um, meeting the TSI criteria on the SAT, ACT, or TSI assessment, um, completing college prep courses, receiving dual credit, 
uh, new to this system this year will be the inclusion of on-ramps course, uh, earning associate's degrees, and then one indicator that's on here, it's listed that we're still in, it is a work in progress as the meeting standards on a composite of indicators indicating college readiness. We also have career readiness for industry certifications, um, and then uh, admitted to post-secondary industry certific cert certific programs, those are gonna be the level one and level two certificates. Um, we should be able to grab that data for this year's accountability as well. And then the last one is enlistment in the United States Armed Forces. Our second domain is our school progress domain. There's two parts to it. There's student growth where we look at um, the amount of growth for a student uh, from one year to the next, whether that's um, growth, just pure growth, or if that's crossing performance level thresholds on the star test from one year to the next. And the second thing we look at is relative performance of uh, the student achievement outcome to economic disadvantage percentage. You can see on the next two slides sort of the breakout of how that works. We're, we're earning, you're earning points for the student growth portion of it by exceeding growth expectations or uh, crossing uh, thresholds. And then the school progress domain for relative performance shows you basically it's a regression analysis that we do. And we look to see uh, uh, that, that relative performance related to that. Yes, sir. Jimmy, let's go back to number uh, 20. Uh, okay. I want to talk about this rule. Okay. Uh, rule provided credit for best campus range between part one and two rather than the average, the caveat that, it, that an F in three out of four domains would be an F overall. Yes. My understanding was, and this is one of the things I want the commissioner to come back and, and talk to us about, so if you're not, I mean, you were, you were in the room as part of this process. Okay. You know that yeah. this is a controversial rule yes, that sir. came about. You also yes, know that this really was not really – According to my understanding, there was not a lot of input provided by school districts relative to this. This is a decision that was kind of made uh, sort of in a vacuum, which I've had this conversation with the commissioner on this particular issue. Can you explain to the, the committee why, um, you know, this was adopted? I mean, this really was kind of a rule that was implemented or adopted that really doesn't have the statutory um, authority. You know, it was more of a, it, it was, the question mark became, it seems like the, the agency started writing legislation in the middle of the rulemaking process. And there were school districts that got caught in this that ended up getting, um, you know, IR campuses that probably shouldn't, including one of mine in my district. And so I had a, okay. I had a significant issue with the school district in, in conversation with them about this. So can you detail that for the committee, please? Um, or do you want to pass that along to the commissioner? Uh, there'll be parts of it that I would love to pass along to the commissioner. <laughs> Wait, but you're here. Um, but you're here now. I, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I can I can I can speak to uh, the 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 thought process behind it, um, and I think it's sort of generally outlined here. Um, we when we were developing the A through F system, we initially had talked about doing an average of the two different parts of the school progress domain. Um, we opted to go with a, based off of stakeholder feedback, to go with a better of. Um, I think the idea was um, from a public perception, since you're, you're able to see all the letter grades that go into the system, whether it's, um, uh, it's all four of them. When you see a letter grades for three of those four domains as Fs and one may be a D, but uh, data-wise it ends up coming out to a, a 60, the perception that that is a, a D campus when you have three Fs and one D is the, the main reason behind that. Um, I think it was a trade-off of this going along with the better of the two for the second domain, but also making sure that we're maintaining some sort of semblance of um, the, making sure that districts um, that are not performing well on all the domains except for one in which they're very low performing um, they, they're, they're not going to be credited as a 60 in that situation and get a D. That was really the emphasis behind it. I will say that we are bringing this topic up at our next policy and technical advisory committees to discuss with them options around it. Um, we want to make sure that their voices are being heard about this, and we did hear about it in our last policy and advisory <laughs> technical advisory meetings. Um, we're trying to give them some options. Um, I think uh, 
my sense from that committee is they understand the reasoning behind it, but they, they are like what you're saying, they didn't really understand the timing of it and the lack of input. So that, that's my perception on it. I, I, I would leave other stuff to the commissioner as far as the decisions behind it. So is this, is, is, is um, this fix can be done through your, your rulemaking or does it need to be statutorily fixed? I think it, it, it was put into place through commissioner rule, adoption of the rule and the, and the accountability manual. So I, I do not believe it would need to be done legislatively. It could be a change, an adjustment that the commissioner would make with our new accountability manual comes out into rulemaking. Unless you don't listen to us. Unless we don't listen to you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Continue. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So as a, just to follow up, if you look at slide 23, that basically shows you how we use the relative performance to create grade bands. Um, we and don't intend on changing these grade bands. These grade bands are in place and they will be in place until we adjust targets. So you can see kind of where the, the dots fit in based off poverty and achievement and you can see where the grades will, will fit into place. The last domain is the closing the gaps domain and this is our um, domain that we use to meet our requirements. And so what we do is basically look at similar indicators that go into domains one and two, but we look at them not just at all, all student level, but we look at them for all the different student groups, including the major race and ethnic groups, special ed students, ELs, and economically disadvantaged. We also include continuously enrolled and mobile students as well as former special ed students. And you can see the, an outline of that at the bottom. Um, basically, we look at four different groups of, of indicators. We look at academic achievement in reading and mathematics at the meets grade level standard. We look at growth and and or um, graduation. If it's a high school, we'll look at graduation. We look at the progress of English language proficiency, and we look at a school quality student success indicator. Um, for high schools, that's the college career military readiness rate, and for middle schools and elementary schools, it's uh, the essentially the, the student achievement domain outcome. And so we look to see that if all the different areas have met targets, there's targets that we established and negotiated with the Department of Ed. Uh, if, if, if campuses meet minimum size and are eligible to be evaluated, we look at the number of, of indicators that they've met over the number of indicators they were evaluated on, create a percentage of that, and then a grades established based off of that. The, the new system, is, we brushed on this briefly, is local accountability. Um, this will be the first year that we will have local accountability applied to the, the state outcomes. We have, I've, right now, the last I heard, between six to eight districts that are going to participate in it this year. And we're very excited about that. Um, it's, it's been a very um, interesting process to work with them, actually a lot of fun, because uh, it's nice to see what districts are bringing to the table. Um, what they're doing in their own districts and what they find important based off their discussions with their um, uh, superintendents or school boards or community. So uh, we're really excited about this and the, the plans themselves, um, we're working through the process with the districts that are participating. Um, we're trying to make sure that we're establishing some, some standards associated with them, but also making sure that the districts have a lot of flexibility to be able to do what they want to. Um, and then we're going to basically put these on our A through F report cards and you'll be able to those outcomes and be able to provide information about how they came to the decisions to apply those local accountability systems. So, and then uh, that's really all the information I have devoted to accountability. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Members, any questions? Um, just a couple follow-ups real quick. Uh, obviously, uh, this was kind of what we wanted to see from commissioner next week it's, it's helpful but we want to get more into the debate on, on on some of these things second thing is um how many ir campuses did we have this year i know we had a significant improvement year over year um specifically based upon you know the, the what's happening within the system so we, do you have that data we for, had for here? yeah the uh the actual number was 432 there's a few of those that, uh, I believe these ratings right here are um, pre-appeal. Pre and so there's a, a handful of these that um, are no longer rated or the, their grade changed from an F to a C, but it's about 5% of them were ended up being required. That number would jump to about 8% um, because of the Harvey impacted campuses, 
we had um, uh, quite a few that weren't rated because of Harvey. That the only way they could be not rated because of Harvey is if they fell into the the um, improvement required bands. Yeah. So on page thirty-eight, I think that's where it is. So so in in yeah. uh, sixteen seventeen, we had three hundred and fifty-eight IR campuses, but it was under kind of a different system, right? That's right. Yes. And sir. then and then we go to six seventy-four and six. It, it, Theoretical. So, if we had implemented the uh, using the A through F methodology, there'd be 674. We went down to 535 without the Harvey. How many Harveys were in there? Do we know? Uh, I don't know the specific number, but um, let's see, I think the less, less than less than 30. Oh yes, yes sir, yeah. yes sir. All right, and then so about 240 campuses uh, that we're down to. These are these are campuses as, as well, right? So not just school districts. Yes sir. And you already talked about the school districts that have their their issues associated with yes. this less than two percent right? that's right yes sir okay members questions no okay thank you sir thank you i don't think there's any point in getting into the next one is there how long is that one going to be joe how long would your presentation be uh, about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. 20. <laughs> we ain't going to make it before the session starts. Well, let's, let's, because how, how much time does the rest of everybody need? I've got three or four other people. What is everybody going to need? I guess we could do Ryan. Ten for Ryan? Well, his has got more. What's his? Can I just do the 1882 for 10 minutes? So it's half. Let's do that. Come on, jump up. Chairman, members, thanks for the negotiation there. I'm excited to speak to you about 1882. My name is Joe Sidlecki. I'm the Associate Commissioner over School Improvement, Charter Schools, and Innovation. Um, Senate Bill 1882 passed last session. Um, as I think most of you all know, it's a bill that it provides um, for a school district to partner with uh, an organization that could be a charter school, a state authorized charter school, a nonprofit organization, new or existing, institute of higher education or governmental entity to operate a school. The actual language in the bill is do contract, do partner to operate a school. Those partnerships have benefits, both financial benefits and accountability. There's three types of partnerships. Uh, the one that has been most in, in papers is the turnaround partnership. So it's partnerships that have districts have engaged in for to find partners to help operate their IR campuses, their current IR campuses. There are two other types of partnerships, and we have seen both of these actually uh, come to fruition in the last year. Uh, the second one would be innovation partnerships with an existing school that where is a district partners with an organization to operate an existing campus that is not IR. We have also seen partnerships formed to create new campuses that not, did not exist before. Um, the benefits on slide three of 1882, there's a financial benefit. That benefit um, all partnerships are eligible for, although not, the, not all partnerships access that benefit and what I mean by that is the benefit is really taking the state average funding um, and comparing that to the ISD funding and then the district would get for the pupils in the um, partnership campus the higher of those two amounts in larger districts that number is larger per pupil in smaller districts it's smaller because smaller districts are closer to or at or below the state average fund. Joe, hold on a second. Yes. Representative Gonzalez has a question. Just quick financial benefit does yes. that apply to any type of partnership so should the partnership be with a university the same type of financial benefit applies yes okay thank you yep any uh, partnership that's approved by the agency for benefit so have you not approved a benefit uh there is one that we have not approved a benefit on so so far Why? because there's a all of these um, partnerships have to be done as subchapter C charter schools in subchapter C code. There's a limit on the number of students that can be in a subchapter C charter school in the district. It's 15%. There are some exceptions to that. IR campuses do not count against that if you do a single feeder pat or a feeder pattern does not count against that, or if parents vote um, for it does not count against that. We had one application that went above the 15%. We denied for that reason and said if they, um, you know, if they were going to be below 15%, they could reapply. What's, what district was that? Longview ISD. Um, so the financial benefit then is very, it, it varies by district and actually varies by campus inside the district. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's larger districts get more financial benefit than smaller districts for the partnerships. 
the accountability benefit, um, if this is a partnership that the agency approves for benefit at the IR at an IR campus, um, it allows uh, the district to, in their partner two years effectively to turn around the campus. Um, in those two years, we cannot order a turnaround plan, we cannot order a board of managers, or we cannot order a closure of that specific campus. Um, it does not break the accountability chain though, so it doesn't wipe the slate clean, it just gives them a two year pause. Um, slide four talks about how a district um, does go about developing a partnership. First, they seek partners, then they need to rigorously evaluate them. That's really one of the things that the agency is looking at when we're looking at partnerships is did the district rigorously evaluate their partner? Did they have proof that they put them through um, a rigorous authorizing and review process? Then the, dis the district's board of trustees must approve the partnership as a subchapter C charter school, which is sometimes referred to as a campus charter. Um, and then the district and the partner finalize their performance contract. There's a number of things that in our rule we've laid out have to be in the performance contract, and we spend a good time looking over those. It's largely to ensure that there's clarity over who's responsible for what, that the partner has the authorities that um, are stated in the law and the rule to actually operate the campus. Um, Key thing there is all of these uh, 1882 partnerships are subchapter C district authorized charter schools. Slide five talks about our process for reviewing uh, or our timeline for reviewing for this year. So we had an application come in December 13th. That was for folks who might have been ahead of the schedule. Um, we had one application there. Our next review cycle, um, which is the deadline for any partnerships having to do with IR campuses or turnaround campuses. Um, is February 4th at 5 p.m. Um, we will then spend the next few weeks evaluating those applications, both evidence that the, the district rigorously evaluated their partner. Yes, sir. Let me stop you. Uh, I want to make sure I understand this review cycle. So the district had to submit a completed application on December 13th by 5 p.m. for the first review process. Would that be correct? Yes. Do I understand that right? Houston ISD did not submit an application, as I understand no, it. No, they did not. And Houston ISD has campuses that will fall into IR uh, potentially again. Is that correct? That is correct. And so basically, because they didn't submit an application under the current statutory law, yep. um, or even try to submit an application under current statutory law, what options do you have at that particular time um, if they fall into IR again? If they fall into IR5, the options that the agency has are either to order closure of the campus or campuses or install a board of managers. Per 1842. Thank you. Right. Go ahead. Um, I'd clarify there is another deadline for turnaround partnerships February 4th, so next Friday, I believe. Um, and then we've got a third cycle. So basically, the point here is we've given districts three opportunities um, at different times to kind of uh, work through their process on the previous slide and submit to us their materials for review. The key point um, that I want to make is that the agency, when we're reviewing the partnerships, we're not approving or denying the partnerships. The district can engage in any partnership they'd like to. We are evaluating whether or not the partnership meets a standard to gain access to the benefits that I talked about on slide two. Right, so if we were to say this is denied, um, it does not mean that the district can't engage in the partnership. They just would not get a pause or they would not get the financial resources. I just want to clarify this one more time. Yes. So Houston ISD missed the deadline, which was December 13th, yes. did not submit. Is there any other opportunity for them to submit under the under the current statute? February 4th so they can submit one more time so they basically have about a week yes for them to submit again what happens if they don't do that the, the choices left the one is hopefully the if they do not then the commissioners left with just the two choices um, in HB 1842 but you can't do this April 1st no the April 1st um, deadline is only for innovation partnerships or partnerships not not regarding an IR campus but can I challenge yes. you a little bit yes because I hear what he's asking and I think that this the school district could still sure, potentially do a partnership President. correct even if and still not get the benefit e okay. yeah always an option it you is just always not get the benefit so it does leave TEA with not just a board of managers or closure they could say okay you can do this so you're just not going to get any financial fiscal benefit well fiscal benefit but they would also not get the accountability benefit so if oh, we're talking about a hypothetical IR4 school here um, if they do not submit a partnership so that we approve by February 4th yeah okay yeah thank you yeah. thank you okay. and what sorry Jim, may I ask one more no go ahead um this is, goes back to 
two sessions ago when we were talking about the turnaround system, and there was a component to do community schools as an op opportunity to do with IR's campuses. Is mm -hmm. that no longer an option? And what that, that, that's not an option, this Bill, but the district could partner with an operator who, well, a partner organization who wants to operate the campus. The key thing here is that partner has to operate the campus. We've taken a pretty broad view of what that means, We're saying that the, that the partner organization must be responsible for delivering the academic program for at least the majority of the students on the campus. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I, wanna, I just want to make sure I'm crystal clear on this. Yes. Crystal clear. Houston ISD did not submit any application as of December 13th, so nothing for you to review. Correct. They have one more chance to do something, which is by next week. That is correct. On Monday. Uh, yes, the fourth. And if yeah, they that miss that Monday. deadline, yep. there's nothing else. Is that correct? Correct. For the IR4 campuses. For the IR4 campuses, yep. that's, you know, unless they get out, yep. right? So, yep. okay. I just want to make sure that everybody understands that because, yes. you know, the school board is, I don't know what they're going to do, but, you know, they're communicating with their constituents to, to that degree that of what their deadlines are. Yep. Okay. And they also did not do this last year either. Correct. Um, or the, the prior the prior school year rather. Yes. Uh, uh, when they when they had to, but Hurricane Harvey hit, which gave them the reprieve uh, on those particular for a campuses. number of campuses. Yeah. yeah. For Kashmir as an example, yeah. right? Yeah. Which Chairman Dutton represents. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, slide six uh, talks uh, just gives you a list of the partnerships that we have approved for benefit to date, and again approving for benefit. You can see there that some of them are partnerships at existing schools, some of them are new school partnerships, and some of them are turnaround partnerships. Um, some of those are with established subchapter D charter school operators, for example, the Grand Prairie Uplift Partnership. Um, others are for new organizations that have been created. There's one with between Austin and the T STEM Coalition, which is between Austin ISD and a nonprofit organization that has traditionally provided support to schools. In this case, now they are operating Mendez Middle School. Uh, final slide, slides. Do you have a question, Mayor? Yes, sir. Representative. Chairman, Chairman May? Yeah. Um, can we go back to the funding and just. Yes. If the funding is a 50% of the state average, correct? Yes. It's the better of the district's ADA and the state average ADA. And the and state average ADA is also the charter school ADA. Has the TEA considered, let's say, over a period of time of a decade, and we continue this this initiative, this yes. program, and you have a, a significant amount of schools, the sustainability financially and how that impacts the overall funding formula, if you just kind of keep on creating these different types of buckets? Yeah, I would say two things. We haven't conducted that analysis. I would say right now, due to subchapter C, <laughs> only 15% of the schools in any particular district can be um, ATA2 partners because only 15% can be subchapter Cs. Um, except for a vote. So let's say except they did, for a vote or there was a movement of right. votes and all these things happen, and now you have a lot of the, the, these yep. partnerships. I'm just curious of the – I just want us to think proactively about what this is – how do we keep sustainable programs? How does yep. this look like 10 years from now? If well, we don't – you know. Well, yep. well, the reality of it is, is that – and not to be disagreeable, the reality is we, did, we conducted an analysis relative to – on the School Finance Commission that was outcome-based that incentivizes teachers and programs so that – we continue to have significant improvements in our system. If we're worried about, geez, we're going to have all these schools that are failing, then they should fire every single one of us. No, no, but yeah, I understand. But that's that's what you're. And asking. I think it's not even that that because you can do this program without being failing, right? So you can use it as an innovative mm -hmm. partnership. And I think that's, that's more of my question of the innovative partnership realities, not the IR realities. Yep. Does that make sense? That, re that required that requires though a vote of the school board, and there was a school district that tried it down in the valley, and their yes. their board said we're not doing that, right? right. You know, so because it eliminates many of the protections for the teacher groups. Okay, thank you. Yep. So. Thank you. Uh, the last slide I have in here is just a little bit. Slide seven talks about our agency supports. Uh, this is a very complicated bill, um, and there's many permutations ways that partnerships could actually be structured. We've created a website, txpartnerships.org, which tries to help explain the districts the different ways that they can do this. It also helps guide them through those first steps that I talked about of 
rigorously evaluating your partners. We've given them model materials for when you're looking at a partnership, these are the questions that you should ask. Here is the, the process that you should put them through to make sure that your partner is capable of actually managing these campuses. We also have a number of federal grants that we make available uh, for districts that want to plan partnerships. Uh, we've had very few of those taken up to date, but we anticipate over time there'll probably be more. Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure I'm clear on eligibility. Yes. So if you're an IR campus, you, there's partnership, there's there's the funding piece, the ADA piece, and then there is the reprieve from accountability. That is. If correct. you're not an IR campus, there's partnership and funding, but not reprieve. Yep. No reprieve. They, they, they don't need the reprieve. And and so just just to one of the previous points, if if a non-IR campus says, hey, we want to partner with whatever charter school A yep. or University B. What's what's the the requ what requirements they need to fifty uh, percent delivery yes. of yep. academic? Yes. So the requirements, uh, like if you were to look at uh, slide nine in the appendix, it gives very high level what some of those requirements are that they have a board. So so between between the two categories, IR and non IR, it still can only be fifteen percent of a district that access the program. Is that right? Unless the the parents vote um, on it or IR campuses do not count towards that, or if it's an individual feature. Better one's more for rural districts to say if they want to do this, then it, you know it's going to be more than 15% if they do a feeder pattern. Why wouldn't an IR campus count towards the 15%? That is in subchapter C. It's okay. in the code. So it can only, you can only be, you can have 15% 1882 non-IR campuses, excluding the IR campuses that are 1882, uh, and then uh, a local decision can expand it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Um, thanks, Joe. And we'll come back to you after we get done. At, we recess, but uh, just make sure that uh, you know one thing I do want to talk about is some some other maybe think about it. But unless Commissioner Morath wants to talk about it, there are some ideas and concepts relative to the only two options that you yep. have. And I know I've talked to the commissioner specifically about maybe adding a third one because yep. uh, there are some there are some perhaps some other opportunities that are out there, meaning that you have a school district that um, has a pretty good board that got in place very recently versus um, uh, closing the campus down. In fact, having that conversation, you know, the commissioner said, well, at that point, a board of managers, I'm pretty sure I'm going to appoint the board that's already there. Right. Uh, because it's just, you know, it was a change in administrative issues that they made. And they made some really tough decisions. So. Uh, I'm not going to mention the districts that are out there, but I know there's a couple of them that maybe there's some potential out there, but we want to yep. be careful about that, so we want to talk about that. Okay. Thanks. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to recess uh, until uh, upon adjournment uh, of the Texas House of Representatives. Thank you. <laughs>